Hey everyone, I'm Kermit Ramirez, and I'm here today with uh, Jake Rockowitz to talk about how uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center uh, uses Drupal to create a digital patient education experience. A little bit about us, I've been at Sloan Kettering uh, in New York City since 2007 and currently work in the Department of Patient and Caregiver Engagement. My main responsibility at the hospital has been the public facing patient and caregiver education website which we'd like to discuss today. Um, Jake, who many of you in the Drupal community know as the web form guy, uh, has been working as a consultant for MSK for well over 20 years and working alongside the communications team he has been instrumental in helping my department achieve many milestones with our site. So glad to have you here talking to me Jake. <laughs> uh, all right, just in brief, uh, the goal of today's session is simply to provide a history of the transition from physical copies of educational resources to dynamically generated multilingual PDFs. So in doing so, we'll discuss the technologies we utilize, methods applied to create this uh, digital experience for patients and caregivers. We'll also discuss the custom admin and editor UI created for our health education specialists. And uh, it's important to know that this won't be so much a technical talk as it's geared towards kind of anyone trying to solve the problems we ran into or creating this uh, custom digital library and experience for users. So uh, Jake is here to discuss a few technical topics um, and can also provide some guidance if any questions arise after the talk. So that said, um, we'll be sure to leave some time after the talk for uh, some Q&A. Right. So I'd like to start off by giving some pre-Drupal history on the project. It's kind of fun. Uh, just a bit about my department. So we are, like I said, patient caregiver engagement. Um, our patient education program works alongside healthcare professionals to provide accurate, clear, and reliable educational resources to the global community. We're a small department of eight. Uh, we have three health education specialists who's, who I guess in the Drupal world can be defined as content editors. Um, they are the ones creating the educational resources alongside clinicians in various practices throughout the hospital. So we'll talk a bit about the editor experience in this talk as well. Um, along with our graphics department, we produced, used to produce uh, hundreds of fact cards and even a few DVDs, fancy. Uh, we stock printed materials in our office space in the Chrysler building uh, in New York City. Uh, these were to be distributed throughout the hospital and clinicians would order hundreds of copies uh, of a resource. So then it gets revised, they end up discarding whatever quantity remained in stock and that's just the way, so just an issue we needed to address. Um, we also wanted to reduce the chance of having outdated resources in circulation, right? So, so around that same time, there was a huge push to have all of our content made available online. So uh, we were connected with our friend Jake Rockwitz, uh, who built and maintained a custom CMS called the iNet tool. Uh, at that time, we started working with our graphics department to create PDF versions of our fact cards to be uploaded to the new CMS. So with iNet2 in place, we were ready to go online. And so we did. It wasn't robust, but it served its purpose for that time. We had a site or, that hosted our PDFs, allowed to sort by category, and a search, very simple. So the problem here was that we only had PDF versions of our content online. This was not ideal for our editors who were working uh, primarily in the MS Word, right? Um, they'd have to go to our graphics department to have any text edits incorporated, and we just needed to figure out a better system. So in addition, there was a demand to move our DVDs to the web. Uh, this just was something we couldn't do in our current system. Um, and then we started thinking about translations. So Jake's Sign Ed Tools supported tagging languages for PDF uploads, but plans were to grow the number of available translations and languages, so we just needed a better way to manage them as well. Uh, and yeah, we needed a better search. Uh, we needed to be able to search the body of a document at least. Um, so lastly, we needed to figure out how to get our resources to patients and caregivers electronically, so lots of demands here. <laughs> um, so as luck would have it, the institution was moving MSKCC.org to Drupal, and Drupal 6 actually. Um, it was the right time for us, we got right to work with our web team, and began development on a brand new website that could meet all the demands. So just to break down what Drupal 6 helped us accomplish, we now had an admin UI. We could add dates to our revisions, track authors, keep notes for each node, uh, among many features. Uh, we implemented a Drupal search, which now allowed us to search the body of a resource for keywords. 
We also figured out how to take HTML resources and generate custom PDFs. So I'll go into that a bit more uh, throughout the talk. And we had a multilingual site which supported various languages. We had revisioning, this was huge. Um, our health ed specialists were now keeping track of edits and versions right in Drupal. Oh, and those DVDs weren't produced anymore. <laughs> we had videos online and embedded in our resources, so not too bad. Um, so with the new setup, we were, we were able to take all of our PDF resources and move them to Drupal. Um, once those were live, our content editors and I began creating HTML versions of new resources. For existing resources and as revisions were needed, we went ahead and created an HTML version for those as well. So here's a screenshot. It took a long time ago. found it in my email somewhere. Um, this was our homepage when we were on Drupal 6. Um, so as with all projects on the web, the work is never done. We're always making, fixing, improving. Um, so the next thing we wanted to figure out was how to manage our chemotherapy and medication resources, right? So we produced hundreds of resources for medications. Uh, there were always changes to the content on those, and considering the hospital was already or already had access to the service called Lingo, uh, Lexicon rather, um, for access to a library of medication leaflets, um, we just partnered up with Lexicon and were able to sync all their medication leaflets to our site uh, nightly via FTP. So with that, we were, we were able to stop producing in-house medication resources, just providing the Lexicon leaflets. So, um, since now there was less print versions of our resources in our office space, our department went ahead and embarked on what was known as the Screen Initiative. <laughs> the plan was to reduce the quantity of print resources in circulation. This was achieved by figuring out which print resources weren't being distributed so much and making them available on the web only. Also, every new resource created was already getting an HTML version, so we were on our way to reducing the print stock. However, clinicians use our educational resources as teaching tools, so res with respect to what works best for our patients and caregivers, print resources could not just go away altogether. So instead, we developed a print style sheet for PDFs generated from HTML that matched the fact card layout that our graphics team created. So clinicians now had the option to print anything on demand or request pre-printed copies of select resources in the same 8.5 by 11 format. That salmon colored fact card was actually what we had <laughs> in stock before. So adding to that, we also introduced a functionality allowing the clinician to send a resources electronically to a patient or caregiver. So even though we had lots going on with the site at this point, there's always a new version, and in 2015, it was time to make the jump. And lo and behold, the jump was to Drupal 8. So our communications team chose to move to D8 and Alpha instead of upgrading to Drupal 7, simply for the long-term benefits that were to be seen with Drupal 8 and being on the latest platform. Uh, so like Drupal 6, we had a very similar setup process. The difference with migration this time around was that we wanted HTML versions for all of our resources. So we took anything that was a PDF only and converted to HTML. This was accomplished by taking the source file, in this case uh, Adobe InDesign files, and converting them to HTML and creating nodes in Drupal. Also. This time around, we wanted to pull in all kinds of content. So we had our in-house published resources and videos. We also carried over the Lexicomp content. Now we were also hosting content from external sources that we've edited out. Um, those included text and video as well. We added MSK's About Herbs database, a tool for the public as well as healthcare professionals, which can help you figure out the value of using common herbs and other dietary supplements. Lastly, we added presentations and webcasts to the mix, and we're pulling in our virtual programs online support groups from the events section of our site. Now that the content was set up, we can talk about implementation with Drupal 8. So I've broken this down into five categories, which had the biggest changes to our site, and I'll go into these individually. All right. So with the admin UI, uh, we reworked everything from the ground up. Uh, you'll notice in this view we have filters for just about any type of data our health education specialist would enter. Um, our health ed specialists are now able to keep track of their revision workflow completely in Drupal. We have spreadsheet exports that are easily customizable and pull any fields admins may need for a quick glance. Uh, recently, in fact, we added Google Analytics and even print order quantity 
to the spreadsheet for each node. So very neat stuff, and it just makes the day-to-day -day work uh, easier for content editors. So one nice thing to note in our node edit form, we needed a method for our editors to add readability scores and actionability scores for each node. So this used to be an Excel sheet for each resource in some folder. <laughs> so Jake added the simple YAML notes field, and that too gets pulled into the admin spreadsheet export for a quick way to view and filter through. So regarding revisioning, we do have content moderation turned on, um, making it easy to revert to previous versions and see notes documenting changes for each. All right, I'm just gonna jump into translations now um, and how we're handling those. So we've been working with Lingotech on getting professional translations and Drupal integration via their module. Um, this has taken about a year and a half or so just to get set up and, and going properly. Um, so, and we've done some custom work on our end. Uh, so just taking a look at the translate form here, you'll notice we are bringing in Lingotech status codes. Uh, that's actually custom. Um, showing you progress from source to target language. You can click through those and get it to go to Lingotech and download back from them. Um, it's a quick click-through click method. Uh, for our editors um, and in fact we recently turned on automatic publishing so even that step should be automated as well. So here's a quick look at the bulk operations with the Lingotech module. You can filter by content type, select as many documents as needed and upload source or download all available translations for each. So to date we have 87% of our content available in Spanish and Russian and we are hoping to expand on that number for other languages this year. All right, jumping into the search engine we are using, uh, we made the switch to Algolia Instant Search uh, in early 2018. Uh, and it's as simple as you can imagine. Type in your keyword and find your resources. Oh, quick demo there. We also have several search refinements or facets as they're known with Algolia. Um, that we've determined would be helpful for users. So you can filter by content type, language, category, and disease. Over. Yeah. <clears throat> I think it's really important. I'm gonna go back for a second and just point out something. When you, when you look at this search, this is a gift. This is as fast as Algolia runs. You start typing and it starts sending data to you. And I wanted to talk about Algolia for a second because um, I just want to throw it out there to everyone, like doing search. Like, there's lots of options out there, and we explored them. Algolia is amazing because it's a service provider that just offers a hosted service solution that just gives you instant results, and their demos really quick on their site. And for a developer, it would take less than a day to set up a prototype where you're just pushing data in, and that's what I'm kind of pointing out here. Is there's really two APIs to pay attention to with Algolia. The first one is Algolia is really they're a temporary company that is at the forefront of we're going to do search and offer amazing APIs to get your search working. And I implemented that front end that you saw in, in about a day because they offer full into search APIs. And what the way to describe those front end APIs is this JavaScript library that will you allow you to build the searches almost complex as like Amazon search, where you have all the facets available, we have categories, you can even do price range, they have geolocation. And um, on a separate note, they've open sourced their geo geolocation library so it tracks where you are and you can kind of do mapping with it. Um, and then on the Drupal side of it, what made Algolia really easy is Search API is just a wonderful system in Drupal. And that's the API that's used to take data from Drupal and push it to any type of search resource. Um, a little note about Search API is it's kind of two APIs. There's the push the data to another resource, which is what we had to do with Algolia. And what we didn't have to do with Algolia is Search API also allows you to pull that data back into Drupal and create a search user experience. In our case, what happened was that user experience was moved to this front-end code, totally kind of a front-end JavaScript rendering this all in the client incredibly quick. Um, and I'm talking about two technologies because so I'm pitching one that's like, it's a great solution. We did very little custom code. We use an external service. We implemented things matter-of-factly. I, off the top of my head, can't recall any custom code in what you're seeing here. Short of like process, setting up the data, the correct data format that we want to send to Algolia, and that was it. 
Everything else was me dropping in their JavaScript widgets to create the user experience. And flipping over to the other aspects of the technology for Sloan Kettering is like the PDFs is a huge part of what they're doing with patient ed materials. And I kind of wanted to give people some insight about dealing with PDFs and convert HTML to PDF conversion. Um, keep it simple is so important when you're generating PDFs on the fly using HTML. Um, we, I did some experimentation where you could take the print version of your site and pop that into a PDF. And I ran into lots of issues because you have all this extra markup and all this extra styles and SAS and, and stuff. And what I concluded for PDF generation is you want to start as simple as possible. The markup behind the PDF documents is H2 tags, bulleted lists, paragraphs. Of, I think a figure tag is the most complex layout element we have because you're just trying to create simple documents. And a little note, custom fonts become a problem because you're on a server generating these documents on the fly. And we've ran into technical issues where we started to avoid custom fonts. Um, one challenge you'll see on lots of sites when you're doing, you see them dynamically generate PDFs is page breaks are a pain um, because it just takes that HTML and just spits it into the document and the editors can't really predict where the page breaks are going to happen and you'll see lots of cases where assets will be spanned across multiple pages, like images will get broken in half. There are some workarounds where you can push the image down or you have to review it and that was one thing over the years we, we really learned with HTML to PDF generation is you have in Drupal, you can preview the document, the, the HTML document that's going to be generated, like the web page. But you also need to make it possible for your content editors, as they're authoring, to see what the PDF is going to look like. And we added in a PDF preview to the node edit form. So they edit the form, and the preview button at the bottom actually goes to a PDF that's generated on the fly. Um, for performance, anything you're going to dynamically generate, caching is critical. Um, we do, we generate the documents and then write them to disk, so we have a cache for anonymous users to keep performance. You can also achieve that with Varnish. Um, and with PDF generation, I just want to say, don't have JavaScript in your code, it's pointless. You're not really, you don't need interaction with PDF, but the moment JavaScript starts entering into that generation process, it will slow things down dramatically, because the, and we'll get into the technology, we're using WK HTML PDF generator. And of this list, I'm really proud of this decision because it was made 10 years ago. And I was looked at all the PDF tools and I made this decision that WebKit was going to be the standard that everyone's going to respect and think about. And we went with this. And the, the basic concept behind this PDF generation tool is it takes the HTML document, runs it through WebKit, and saves it as a PDF. It is very close to what you see when you're in Safari or Chrome when you hit print and what you're about to print out, that's a PDF document that's going to go to your printer. And that's worked out really well for us. We've ran into one or two issues where WKHTML PDF is slightly behind where WebKit is. I ran into the simple one. Uh, CSS three columns just don't work in this generator because that's kind of a new technology and it just, it, they, haven't back port, they haven't caught upstream in this library to that technology because WebKit has a lot of different versions floating around. Um, and then the last two were just, this is kind of a tricky thing with open source, is there's no one tool that will solve every problem. So these other two PDF tools were used for really simple but key things to manage PDF documents. XPDF is simply used to get the page number, the number of pages in the PDF that's being generated so that we can tell someone this is a 10-page PDF. So if they're about to download the document or open the document, they have some sense of how long the document's going to be. And GoScript is used, and Kurt's going to demo this for a second, it's used for PDF bundling. So patients don't get one document, they get multiple documents. So they're going through like treatment, so they might get a prepare for your surgery guide, how to get to Sloan Kettering, and GoScript just allows us to take all those documents and bundle them together into one PDF document that they can print out and, and even take with them. Um, and I really am talking a lot about custom code here because all that stuff, I. Personally, in my experience, there are Drupal modules, and it's always important to test the Drupal module before you go into custom code land. But the problem for Sloan Kettering is they needed perfect PDFs. They needed as much control as they could possibly have over the PDF generation and know that if there's an issue, it could be fixed. So we didn't go, I've used these modules in the past, and my experience was go to the APIs. And this is an interesting balancing act with Drupal is you should use Contrib, but sometimes it's easier to just go to the APIs. And what I mean is, calling the command line tools directly and being like, here's the HTML we need, generate it back. 
It's faster, it's simpler, it was easier to debug. Um, does require a developer. And I'm going to hand it back to Kermit. Thanks, Jake. So of all the work we've done to make HTML to PDF work and look as good as it does, uh, we had no reason to hold on to the fact card format any longer. Um, we're able to clear those out. Um, adding to that, we are even offering a large font version uh, of the PDF for all of our resources and just a nice addition for accessibility in general. <clears throat> so now I'd like to talk a bit about the editor we're using in D8. And our WYSIWYG is CK editor with some enhancements we've decided to make over the years. So I'm going to go over just a few of those, uh, a few of my favorites. Um, so for example here, you'll notice in the screenshot for the node edit form that we're actually seeing what the PDF print version will look like right in CK editor. So very nice to have when you have the editors maintaining HTML and PDF versions of resources. Um, we've also added the code mirror module, which improves uh, the source view in CK editor. So this has helped prevent syntax errors for our content editors as well. And my personal favorite has been the IMCE module. So just full disclosure, I don't know what IMCE stands for. <laughs> I, I, I Google it, it really doesn't matter, it, just know it works. Um, so if you need a better way to manage images in Drupal, this is it. Uh, create shared repositories for images to be used in multiple nodes, store and manage your source files, it's really a powerful tool um, in our day to day. Highly recommended. Um, we've also enabled CK Editor templates. So, this we use to display a menu with reusable code for our content editors. Um, we're using it for icons, callouts, and things like that. But in general, it's helpful for when you don't want to remember long snippets of code. <laughs> All right. Lastly, uh, this is something we're working on at the moment. Uh, we're using Entity Embed to allow content editors to add and edit snippets of text within a node's body. So if edited, we can choose to sync the snippet wherever it's embedded, it's the idea. Um, so imagine if we have several resources with the same section detailing water restrictions for a patient having surgery, and those restrictions change hospital-wide. Uh, we can make the change in one place, sync, and track the revisions. And that's the hope with this project. Um, so also, we'll be able to turn on translations for those snippets as well, and this is just promising to be another very powerful tool in our day-to-day. -day. So, now that I've covered how everything is created and updated, uh, we can talk about how everything is distributed. So, as I mentioned before, the printout is still necessary for clinicians teaching patients and caregivers in the inpatient or outpatient setting. So every resource we create is available to print on demand as an 8.5 by 11 PDF. Uh, we do also offer select resources that we print and deliver through third-party vendor uh, for those clinics uh, not equipped to print resources on demand. Okay. And for requesting those printouts, uh, Jake and I work to get web forms going on our site and have made our educational resource request form accessible uh, for internal users. So we set it up so that the user logs in and their delivery information is pre-populated on the form, making it quick to create a submission. Uh, we've also made it easy for internal users to store lists of resources by creating a bookmarking function. Um, users can select resources, as you can see here, uh, create lists stored on their profile, and reuse as needed to quickly access, send to patient, or print. Okay. So tied to that, we added a function that takes your list of resources and generates a PDF bundle in the language of your choice. With us, the build script. Yep. So, probably the most important integration is our send to patient functionality. So, internal users can take their list of resources and send it directly to a patient or caregiver along with the custom message. If the patient is a MyMSK patient portal user, we pass the resources and message over to their inbox in the patient portal. Uh, we're also able to determine the patient's preferred language from this integration and send resources in the language the patient prefers. Lastly, and briefly for distribution, we have optimized our pages for AMP, or accelerated uh, mobile pages. AMP is essentially a framework for creating fast-loading mobile pages. It's a Google-backed project, and we've been able to optimize our pages for performance on mobile. 
on the right is just a preview of what you are seeing with an app ready page. All right. Lastly, one important thing we can take into consideration in our day to day is user feedback. Um, and using web forms, we have several surveys throughout the site, and our feedback form itself has been one great way to figure out issues we just don't think about. It's funny because so many of the great ideas we've had come from users not at MSK. Um, with that, uh, thank you so much for listening. Um, I hope you enjoyed this overview of the evolution of the Patient and Caregiver Education website. I'd like to thank my team in Patient and Caregiver Engagement, Jake Rockwitz, Communications IS at MSK. And I guess with that, I'll open the floor for any questions you have for me or Jake. Yes, sir. Do you, do you have, uh, have a word, uh, are you able to add like charts and things like that into the, uh, into the PDF? Yeah, so the question is, am I able to add charts into the PDFs? And they're generated from the HTML, right? So we'll have table classes, and that gets converted in the PDF. I can add, I, I can add, I, like, I, it's kind of crazy how much I know about PDF generation at this point, <laughs> WKHTML. Um, we have had a, it's, it's, Drupal is struggling with it. SVG is a way to do charts, but Drupal doesn't totally support SVG. Uh, like, image fields don't support SVG images. So we're slowly, we're trying to transition to SVG. We're working out some solutions to get those charts in. Right now we do a lot of PNGs, and that is a limitation in printing because it gets a little pixelated. If you get an SVG and it's vector-based, you'll get a crisp image. And we're working on pushing that a little bit. Translations, that has really hurt a lot because PNGs with text graphics on it, like if you're like, here's your lung and here's a little arrow pointing to some part, uh, translating that image gets very expensive because a designer on, in Lingotech opens that PNG and sits there and swaps out the text. And we're also trying to figure that one out. And that probably goes back to SVG, but that's very hard Oh God, I haven't figured it out. SVG graphics at scale are res responsive with text floating on top of it. Um, and getting in produce, because the PNG is a lot easier. They, take, they generate the PNG and then we insert it. I hope that helps. Yeah. Okay. Um, Angolia, is it free? Um, oh yeah, I mean, we got to repeat the question. So I'm sorry, the previous question, uh, is Algolia free? Um, they off it's not free, it's a service provider. I don't know what the pricing is. But they offer, you know, they're definitely one of those free to try, and then you got to pay for it and get you started. I don't, um, I don't think it's crazy. Oh, you, uh, do you have a price, Jeff? I am surprised. Yeah, on the page, it's, um, it's free. Twenty nine a month for kind of a twenty nine a month, and, and like five hundred a month for enterprise. I, I mean, the thing you get out of the box, like. You could go purchase a solar provider, but then you got to build this whole crazy front end. You're paying $29 for brilliant APIs that are so well maintained. I, I could pitch out going because I worked with them, I was skeptical, but they they understand that importance of those front end APIs, that that's just as valuable as the hosting that they're doing. And those APIs are rocket fast, they streamlined, and they open source a lot of stuff so that they are the, the quality that they're building these APIs, they get a lot of feedback on and they respond. And, um, I think it's worth it. That's my experience with it. To that end, so how are they indexing the content? Are they, do they have a copy of that content on site? Yeah. Them? And, uh, and if they, uh, no, no, wait for yeah. no, no, what, finish what question, I got to. Since you guys are dealing with patient information yeah. and, and sorts of things like that, um, uh, is there any like privacy or compliance right. with them holding some of your content? Um, okay, the question is really about how that data gets into Algolia and the indexing of it. It's, it's very important. Okay, let's just establish the patient information side of this. There is none. Right, this is all... It's an anonymous, I mean, the site, we, we used to, you know, like, and, and even these documents, you know, there's revisions and they're checked to make sure, like, the, a chart doesn't, you know, a picture does none of those people are patients, let's put it that way, every photo he just showed you, they're not. Um, so that's established. Um, with pushing the data to Algolia, um, Search API, I, I'm a huge fan of that module because what Search API does is it just allows you to be like, it, it handles the relationship of Drupal to a search based API. And search based APIs are give me the data, tell me what the data is, I'm going to index it, is it indexed, when should I, you know, and you're pushing data in. Now, when you get to Algolia, it is, it's an object store. And when that data goes in, think of it as just a simple, like, just sewn array of data and you can preview it. 
and they have little syntaxes to build the facets off of it. So for taxonomy, I think it's a, an array of just text strings. Um, and they provide good tools that you can go in. Now, with their search, I'm going to give a little honest statement about their search. It is not as rich as Google because when you do objects, you don't get link relationships. And, but they give you full flexibility to do weighting and sort it out. And what we found, a couple of things, we grabbed our Google Analytics, um, Eric Saad helped with this, is grabbing the Google Analytics data and putting it into Algolia to help with weighting. Um, the speed of the search makes a huge difference because people do know the keywords that they're looking for and they usually get the documents quickly. Would I say Algolia could search the web? Probably not. Like, but when you're dealing with keywords, and the facets help a lot. So that's the, it's similar, I think that the explanation is it's very similar to Solar. Uh, um, except to focus that speed. The instant search, uh, Solar has like, you can get an Ajax component. It is not anywhere near that. Um, other so questions? The question I go back to him. So you give the content to them, mm -hmm. or you get the search engine and then you use it in, in between your uh, things? They, they have an API where you can call them like a JSON API and get the data, but what they're doing is they're providing you the front end framework to build your own, like to build an out of the box. It's like an out of the box. You just start. Plugging so in you there. Give your content to them. What? Your your content goes up to them in sort of an object store that you uh -huh. can preview. So yeah, with patient data, you gotta be. You could. I would never push patient data. We do push um, administrative data, and we just decide. And you can control in searches. Like we have all their data going up for patient. Data. I have two searches. I have a public facing search, <laughs> and on that public facing search, I return only public facing data. But like we'll have de do re um, review dates. And you can specify when that comes down in the packet. So, like, yeah, I'm thinking of like uh, you have the favorites. Mm -hmm. So the favorites is someone's personal preference of saving things that they're interested in. Yeah. So if someone's saving a whole bunch of stuff on breast cancer or whatever, then there's some inclination to know that that person is likely to have breast cancer. And then yeah. if that's stored, then there's possibly someone saying, well, yeah. now you're publicly showing that this person may have breast cancer. You're paying attention to a lot of details there. It's, I'll, I'll, clar okay. pharmaceutical I'll clarify. I'll clarify. We can't do anything. Yeah. So. I, I want to address it because it's important that everyone understands the importance of that, where the scenario you described in data, it's like, um, what we're demoing is what clinicians use right. to bundle an anonymous packet that's then sent off to a patient portal where they identify the patient in that portal. Mm -hmm. So, and that's never going to Algolia. And that widget is not public facing because we run into a challenge there. Um, I personally think there's some way to do local storage where you're identifying the person because it's stored on their machine. It's okay, but we haven't gone there because it's a tricky one. Um, Oh, no, no, you just answered it. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, I, I know. <laughs> Same patient data, we got to talk about. What has been like the feedback of uh, like the content editors and translators and how they've been involved kind of in the process of this? So, the question was what has been the feedback from and patients and uh, like user feedback? No, but more like the internal like, editors and oh. translators that you work with and have they been, like, how have you involved them in the process? Yeah, so definitely. Frequent, uh, so, what's the involvement of the content editors basically in their feedback? Um, yeah, weekly meetings all the time, uh, trying to figure out what works best, um, you know, little nuances that we need to fix, um, like just showing analytics right on the spot to help them with their revision workflow, that helps. Um, you know, for translations, uh, yeah, we, we, it, was, it was quite a while of setup for that, um, so just figuring out what works best in terms of that workflow of that click through that I showed you. Um, click the English source, uploads to Lingotech, and we just wanted the user to pull down, that's all. We're, they're not doing the QA, we don't have professional translators on our end. Um, so they do, they have a, you know, levels of that for professional translation that we pay for. <laughs> um, but yeah, what, what we pull down should be, you know, fine. And now we're doing automatic publishing, so we don't really worry about that. Um, yeah, so less for the content editor to worry about, that's the goal. Just, you know, because we're trying to pump out these professional, professionally written documents um, at a sixth grade reading level, adding to that. <laughs> so, you know. Um, can I add, I want to add a little, um, what I think is great about the presentation is it's a very iterative process of building something like this. And with the content editor, with the content editor experience, these features have been gradually added on. I mean, personally, you know, I'm like a back-end, you know, software architect. I think it's really, this is just anyone who deals with content editors and trying to build an experience for them, is every year you need to sit down and say, what do you need? What's slowing you down from getting things done? And the template system, like that CK editor template was one of those where we keep having to cut and paste system. I keep forgetting 
how to build the proper table yeah. and giving them that snippet. And Kermit has full authoring over that. Um, another thing he didn't demo, and this is an interesting, we, we need to add this slide. Mm -hmm. They have a, a stock, one document that's a hidden style guide. So it just shows every style that they possibly would use in these documents. All the markers. And it's valuable for them because they can see what they're going to get. And for me, when we're testing the PDF generation, I can see exactly what's going to Like We're on, all on the same page on what's the goal. But you got to keep all of that was iterative. And I, yeah. I could think of each year that we added these features and stacked them on. Yeah, just, just recently we added a feature, you know, if they hit back, just throw a, a call back at them. Hey, did you mean to, you know, something like that. So, Not lose your information. Right. Check. Uh, so you're doing medical information on site. Mm -hmm. um, so are you going through, what sort of copy approval do you mm -hmm. go through? Is there work I'm stepping back. That? Yeah. And so the translations then, after stuff is sent off to Lego Tech and translated, do you have to do copy Funny. approval in the, in the right. translation? So the question is related to copy editing, proofreading our, our resources, right? Um, and, and so, yeah, our, our content editors have a revision workflow, which involves a second person that's proofreading after a resource is published. We have also a uh, team of professionals uh, for different practices that uh, we send all our resources to once a month, and th those are new resources that will get approved and uh, published. Um, that, does that answer the question for Copy editing, at least? I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I don't know if you have to go through legal approvals, too, for, for the FDA kind of uh, like Yeah, I mean, you know, every, so we call the content experts uh, clinicians, right? I mean, that's that's who's really working on the document. Our editors are just editing, proofreading, publishing, adding images, that kind of stuff. So yeah, there's no legal involvement there, but I don't know. Uh, on the translation side. So on the translation side, yeah, we, we've, so we did a ton of QA. This is why it took a year and a half, right? On the Spanish and Russian, created style guides, created words to not translate, addresses that should be translated or not, you know, just going back. And then, you know, it, it's hard to figure out what works best in, that, in certain languages, right? Like Spanish can be correct in one and not in the other. Um, so yeah, we had, uh, from the language assistant program at Stone Kettering, um, a couple of their folks join us in that QA process, um, establishing these style guides, glossaries, and that now lives in Lingotech's translation management system. And you know, when the translation get, gets pushed up, it searches for any uh, terms in there. And you know, their professional translator should be following the style guy as well. So these are the processes that we've set in place before you know, officially publishing their resources. So, but when the translations come back, mm -hmm. there's no clinicians who then right. speak that language and right. say, oh yeah, this is cool. So yeah. So the question is, if clinicians check right the languages, <laughs> we haven't gotten that yet, uh, thankfully. Um, you know, the user feedback too though has helped us. There, if there is a typo for whatever reason, um, I can't tell you Russian, right? So um, we've had user feedback say, "Oh, this is wrong," and we'll send it back to Lingotech, and they'll send us back the corrected translation. Um, we try to address that as rapidly as possible. Captain first. Looks like you've got about, you've got several. Uh, third-party applications that you're using for your HTML and PDF. Mm -hmm. How much is that running you guys a, uh, a month? Those are all free. The three things I use wait, to generate the PDFs. Yeah. All open source. Like I can't. All those libraries and, and the, of those three libraries, all three of those are like ten. So, I'm mean, going to be very honest. I picked them ten years ago. And we haven't changed them. They're very standard. Like GoScript is a very standard thing that's available. Like I think it comes with OSX sometimes. Um, they're, they're free. It's okay, open yeah. source. WK. Uh, uh, WK HTML PDF. Uh, that had uh, its own dedicated URL. So I was thinking that that was a, uh, a no. Uh, they a paid service. Okay. They just got that URL a long time ago. They were on SourceForge and they moved over to GitHub and they've just been plugging away. I mean, they they are a great open source project because it's steady but not crazy. You know, they they're not burning out. They're doing the work. Doing releases and it's been stable and reliable. Okay. But all I, I work for I work for Johns Hopkins and we've got a lot of the same mm -hmm. issues with the uh, PDFs. We've got a lot of people that are putting PDFs into the content mm -hmm. and like we're trying to get uh, like have have it be like really accessible <laughs> and, and that's that's 
one of the things <coughs> that, uh, that interests me in, 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 in HTML and PDF generation. Yeah, I mean, I did a little exploration on the paid ones, and I just had this. It was like I was new to open source and Drupal, and Drupal was pushing WKHTML, and I was willing to bet money on it. And I think it was worth it. But I will say that, and the paid ones are very expensive. They might have come down over the years, but we, we were, for server side PDF generation, you were looking at like a ten thousand dollar investment that is pretty heavy. Um, and one other, I want to emphasize, uh, there's two pro two ways to do PDFs. You can take HTML and convert it to PDF, and then there are tools out there where you literally say the title in this PDF, doc you're, you're programming the PDF document. You're, you're describing the content object-oriented code, and it generates a PDF. Not There's no HTML, there's no style sheet. You're, like, building it. And that's crazy. I, I mean, if you need fancy, like, I could see the use case, you're generating a pamphlet on the fly, and you need perfect design. But the HTML conversion seems like the most stable way to, you know, to do it. Are we good on time? Are we over? Are, we good? Are, guys, okay. All right, are there any other questions? I mean, we could talk after, too. I mean, yeah, how do you determine the filter categories for the instant search? Is it just the feedback from doctors? Or, uh, yeah, that, that was based on feedback from clinicians as well. Is it strictly clinicians or also just like uh, patients, et cetera? Uh, clinicians, yeah, as far as I can. Yeah, so. Yeah, I mean, when I'll, like you, you try, guys are trying to figure out their, their workflow, and it's like they get a lot of feedback and they listen to it. You know, like the doctors and patients, there's a feedback form on every page. So patients will complain. They keep track of it. They note it. They change things, the language. And some kind of is very good at figuring out, I don't know, you can't refer to lung cancer as thoracic cancer. Make sure you say lung every time and have that taxonomy available. How, how are you managing the revision history? Um, how long back are you going? Yeah, the question is how long are we managing, or how far back do we go with managing the revision history? And it's everything. We keep everything since we started Drupal 8. Um, Did you keep the backlog from Drupal 6? That, Ooh, yeah. that didn't carry over, I think, um, most, it did. most were PDFs. No, no, I, I, it, it did. We did. We actually went over, um, there's two herbs. We do herbal, like, about herbs, and I got to speak yeah, in the mic. We do about herbs and um, the patient had, there's legal issues that you, uh, so we migrated those revisions. We are, we've explored archiving them, I and what I will throw out there is like what um, Pfizer's been doing, because I want to give credit for people pushing content moderation at core. <laughs> they're really thinking about this issue for healthcare. They're like, we need legal, concrete revisions going back forever, never delete a revision, be able to pull a revision at any time. So if there's any legal issues, you can be like, on this date, this was the document displayed. And that's what we're striving for, and it's it's a slight challenge, but we're we're getting there. Like even with those embedded snippets, I'm trying to figure out how. Four years ago, when a snippet was embedded inside this document, what was the snippet, and is it the right revision in the right language? And it's worth doing, and we're going to figure this out. And, and just to kind of pick back off on that, mm -hmm. we're not just relying on revisions. We've mm -hmm. been and content moderation. We're also incorporating some like screenshot technology and things like that to also do like point in time. So mm -hmm. um, we're, we're going to use both the moderation as yeah. very much, but as well do almost like our own way back tool. Um, yeah, um, you do the pitch for page freezer. Because I give them credit. Yeah, so we were trying to figure out the archiving solution on our end for, for legal purposes, obviously, and um, figured out the best options. We, we just exposed a download PDF button for the revision, and that's it. That's, that's what we get. That's, that's what you would get from page freezer. Except, right? I, I mean, I will. So we're, I'm going to throw a page freezer as a service that will crawl your site and give you an archive of it. Um, it's pretty close to what we're able to generate in Drupal. I will throw out there that they generate a timestamp PDF with a unit, like, it's, it's the most secure version you could possibly have because it's a third party saying this is what the content looked like on that date. Because people say, what happens if someone goes and alters this label in the database? And I, I think in a legal standing, this is to the best of our knowledge what the data was on this date. And that's a reasonable, you, you want to do the best you can but not go overboard. We're not sending <laughs> backup tapes of Drupal going <laughs> off to a silo somewhere every day. And even times when we've been with the FDA, they understand that there's a certain level of ethics that are going on yeah. and mm. things like that. So yeah, it's a great topic. I love that topic because it's really, it's like, we now all realize the value of that. It means there. Well, we're just uh, signing on with Digital Tech to do a few pages uh, with pages that you need. I'm just kind of interested in your experience with them, with their good partners. Um, also, like, we're getting a few 
document translation done? Is, is that what you guys did, or did you do the machine translation? Yeah, so the question is about our experience with Lindotech and so, you know, it's been mostly positive, but we're only doing Spanish and Russian, to be clear, at the moment. We haven't expanded to other languages yet, but we do look forward to doing that. I mean, it took a while, like I said, to manage those glossaries, style guides, just get, a, get that all settled. But I think once you've done all that QA, you know, that's what they're sticking to. Um, you know, is, it, is it human translation? We're, yeah, we're using human translation with a second uh, person reviewing as well. So, and the, the second, I just wanted the second revert person is Lingotech. Correct, yeah, it's Lingotech. Two <laughs> translators <laughs> confirming. Mm -hmm. um, I'll, I'll, I'll give, Lingotech's been, from a technology perspective in Drupal, they're one of the largest contributors to Drupal 8. They put a huge amount of energy into the multilingual, so their support is top notch, um, and they're supporting their module actively, and they've been really good about that. And I mean, for people who want to try Lingotech, they offer free machine translation, so I, even in my demos with webform stuff, you can just install Lingotech, go on their service, register, and they'll give you free machine translation for small, you know, for small sites, and you get to preview the workflow. Um, granted, do not go live with machine translation. Use professional services that are vetted, and they have a full system for that. And they're one nice thing about Lingotech, just to add, is that they are not just Drupal; they do any type of translation, so they integrate with WordPress too, which is really powerful for big organizations. That's very powerful. I think my question related to this one is, what's the difference between machine translation and the Google Translate? Yeah. Um, oh, God, I feel like when you ask these questions, it's like, it's why do I know all these answers? Um, <laughs> so, with, okay, oh, what's the difference between their machine translation and Google Translation? Um, what's going on with all these translation providers when they do machine translation is they are using either Microsoft or Google. and. Um, Google does not offer their APIs so easily for free. Um, I, what's Azure? What, what is the name of Microsoft Cloud Service? Azure. 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 Yeah, because I'm, I'm a Lingo. Uh, I'm Azure. 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 Yeah. Um, Lingo is actually using Azure, because and they are paying. It's a nice thing that they're paying for those translations. Those machine translations, when you're testing, cost them a few pennies, and they just keep passing it through. But you can. Um, Actually, I think they have it in the workflow where you actually set up your Azure account and that. Microsoft gives away some free translations. Um, but yeah, they're not doing their own machine. They're trying to use AI level. But those are just not that good. Yes. I think you also mentioned uh, changing the Google Translate to HTML. Can you speak on that? Okay. So when we did the micro, <laughs> we avoided this topic because it was, goes back all the way to Drupal 6. So they had all those PDF documents, and I can't recall off the top of my head how I got those PDFs to spit out HTML. It was a lot. So you can convert HTML to, I mean, PDF to HTML. That's the part of files. They were InDesign files. We did use some scripts, but it's a lot of manual work. I mean, one thing they did in their workflow was to make that commitment, and over three years they were able to get rid of all the just PDF documents, and some were manual. You can't, I forget the tools, do there are some things that will dump out PDF documents um, into HTML, and then it's not, you have to clean it up. All right, if no other questions, uh, thank you guys so much. Appreciate your time. Yeah, that was great. Thanks.